Welcome to First Reformed Church. My name is Tim Breen, and I have the pleasure of ser- serving this congregation as the lead pastor. And I'm just really thankful that you are with us this morning. It's a special day. Anytime we celebrate the Lord's Supper together is wonderful. And today is especially a great day if you're new, because today we are kicking off a brand new message series that will take us pretty much to the end of 2019, which is the same thing as saying to the end of the decade. So, Uh, settle in. It's going to be fun together as we think about this new message series called Jesus Is. Jesus Is. And Jesus Is uh, is a series of teachings that's based on the New Testament book of John. John is one of four gospels which report on the life and teachings of Jesus. And one of the more interesting aspects of John's gospel is that John spends extended time looking at who Jesus says that he is. There is more Jesus on Jesus in John than there is in the other gospels. And what we'll be zeroing in on in this series is a sequence of seven times in which Jesus makes reference to himself. And these seven passages are often called the I Am's of Jesus. I Am. You realize how powerful of a phrase I Am can be? It's actually one of the most impactful phrases in all of language because I am, whenever you say that, whenever you begin a sentence that way, it signals imminent self-disclosure. What you say after you say I am is a testament to your self-understanding. I am reveals what your role is, what your purpose looks like, which relationships you value. I thought maybe as kind of a lead into the series this morning, I would share with you a handful of other uh, non-biblical but pretty well-known I am statements. And I drew these from uh, media and history, and I thought it'd, it'd kind of be fun to do this a little bit interactively this morning. So maybe even, I thought, let's do it as a competition. All right, so what I want to do this morning is have a little bit of a competition between the north side of church here, center line this way, and the south side of church. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you each a couple of turns here, and I'm going to read for you an I am statement, uh, and it could be from history, it could be from literature, it could be from the movies, and if you are able to identify the speaker or the context of the I am statement, I want you to shout it out whenever you got it, all right? And we'll see whether our north side or our south side uh, does better with this, all right? So let's begin here with the north side. Who said, I am the greatest. You're on the south side, Mark. (laughs) Negative one points for south side and plus one. (laughs) All right. So one point for the north side. Now let's go to the south side. You can flip that. That was Muhammad Ali. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go to the next one. I am blank of Montanui. You will board my boat and sail across the sea. Who is it? Moana, that's right. I'm still hearing north side people call out. This is pretty simple. Your turn, their turn. We're going to alternate. So now, we got it now? It's back to the north side. All right, this one is for you. I am your father. Who is that? Darth Vader. That's right. All right, you're rolling. Back to the south side here. Seattle, I am listening. Who's that? Frazier Crane. That's right. We are four for four as a church. Now these are going to get a little bit more difficult here. Back to the north side. I am 16 going on 17. Liesel from from which movie? Sound of Music. Very good. All right. Three points for the north side. Back to the south side for this one. I am not a crook. Richard Nixon. That's right. President Richard Nixon wagging his finger. All right. We are perfect so far. Let's increase the difficulty a little bit. How about this one? I think, therefore I am. 
Descartes, absolutely. Rene Descartes, the philosopher. Very good. Kind of existential philosophy. He was born with that phrase, cogito ergo sum. All right, four for four. Let's go back to the south side here. Just as I am without one belief. Who used to sing this all the time? George Beverly Shea, that's right, at the end of those uh, Billy Graham crusades, just as I am without one plea. All right, four and four, couple left to go for each side here, back to the north side. I am the danger, Skylar. I am the one who knocks. Who said that? Walter White, somebody got it, all right, from Breaking Bad. Very good, five points for the north. They're getting harder, back to the south side. I am the very model of a modern major general. Who said that? Yeah, but does anybody know who said it? It's from, it's pretty close, we'll give you a point. It's from the Pirates of Penzance, right? And it is, flip ahead for me, Keith. It is Major Stanley from the Pirates of Penzance. We'll give you a point. All right, you're close enough. Five and five. All right, this is what it, these, now these are pretty difficult. Last round. We're going to see if we can get them all. Back to the north side here. I am not afraid of an army of lions led by a sheep. I am afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. Anybody know who said that? Not Moses, but you're pretty close to the right time period. It's an ancient figure. Not David. Greek commander Alexander the Great. I love this quote. I'm afraid of an army led by sheep. I'm afraid of an army of sheep led by a lion. Great quote. All right, back to the south side here for the last one. I am by heritage a Jew, by citizenship a Swiss, by makeup a human being, and only a human being. Anybody know who said that? Let's put it on the screen. That was Albert Einstein. I'm a human, but only a human. So pretty good. About five and five. Very good. You guys know your I am's well. The phrase I am is a super important one. It is an attention grabber. Because saying I am signals that you're going to express your identity your awareness of yourself. You can say, I am a Cyclone fan, or I am a veteran, or I am only a kid, or I am engaged, or even I am pretty discouraged today. And when we say these kinds of things, church, people listen, they pay attention. Because of who you say you are, suddenly some people will feel a natural connection with you. They'll feel a draw to you when you reveal who you are. But the opposite is also true. Saying who you are sometimes kind of plants a flag in the ground and that will create conflict or animosity. Because you will have claimed something or marked yourself in a certain way. You will have revealed to the world who you believe that you are. When Jesus said, I am, it powerfully impacted the radius of people closest to him. And in time... These seven statements shaped the church, too. They shaped the church after his ascension. And I don't think it's an exaggeration at all to say that how you and I today in 2019 conceive of Jesus and how we worship and witness corresponds and connects to what Jesus said about himself in the I Ams. Now, because over the course of the rest of the calendar year, we're going to try to sync up these seven messages with important Advent themes and Christmas themes. We're not going to go through them in exactly the biblical order, but we are going to begin today with the first message drawn from the first of Jesus' I Am statements, and that is this saying that's on the screen. I am, don't, that you had it right before, Keith, I am the bread of life. 
And the story that wraps this statement plays out uh, over the course of some 71 verses in John chapter 6. Really over the course of three different acts, sort of with an interlude of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee as well. And you've heard quite a bit of this sequence this morning, so let's offer a little summary together of what happens uh, in John 6. In the first act, which Karina read, Jesus miraculously provides bread and fish for a group of several thousand people. On that day, Jesus was presented with five dinner rolls and a couple of fish. And after thanking God for it, Jesus caused that small meal to multiply and multiply and multiply again in order to feed an enormous crowd. And the Bible says that everyone eats their fill, and at the end, they're so full that they start gathering up the leftovers, and that there are 12 baskets full of leftovers. Now, that's a a really important detail, and I want you to know, don't miss this, that's a huge factor in what happens next in the story. Everyone was full and there were leftovers. Now, that's so fascinating because at this time and place, it was certainly not common to be really and truly full. Among the poor peasants of ancient Galilee, it would have been far more common to be hungry. As a matter of fact, uh, New Testament scholar D.A. Carson suggests that in the economy of ancient Galilee, food was so expensive, so hard to come by, that people often spent 85% of their income on food. Think about that, 85% of your paycheck going to groceries. I know there's a Whole Foods joke in here somewhere, but I'm going to leave it for another day. But hunger is powerful. Hunger transforms people. British poet and scholar Lawrence Binion personifies hunger this way. Listen to how in this poem he describes hunger. Put these words on the screen. I come among the peoples like a shadow. I sit down by each man's side. None sees me, but they look on one another and know that I'm there. My silence is like the silence of the tide that buries the playground of children, like the deepening of frost in the slow night. When birds are dead in the morning, armies trample, invade, destroy, with guns roaring from earth and air, and I'm more terrible than armies." I am more feared than the cannon. Kings and chancellors give commands. I give no command to any. But I, hunger, am listened to more than kings and more than passionate orators. I unswear words and undo deeds. Naked things know me. I am first and last to be felt of the living. I am am hunger. Hunger is a powerful, elemental force. And what Lawrence Binion wrote about was a point not lost on the ad consultants at Snickers, right? You've probably seen those commercials. You're not yourself when you're hungry, right? So they created a whole advertising campaign that demonstrates how people become weird and unpredictable when they're hungry. So you have a football player that plays like Betty White, and uh, the guy on the road trip turns into Patti LaBelle, the diva. And actually, there's a really great one where a ninja turns into Mr. Bean. So check that out on YouTube. You are not yourself when you're hungry. And people will go to great lengths to find satisfaction from their hunger. And especially to be filled in the way that Jesus fills the people in John chapter 6. 
and seen one. It's not a surprise then to read what we read at the end of that scene. Verse 15 says that the people intended to come and to take Jesus and make him their king by force. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? This is the ultimate government food plan, right? Think about your expenses at the end of the month. If someone said to you, hey, by appointing this person king, we're going to cut your grocery bill by 85%, you'd want that too, right? And so the next day, the crowds went across the Sea of Galilee in search of Jesus. And, and they find him. They catch up with him in the next act, which is playing out in the city of Capernaum. And that's where the story resumes in John 6, verse 25. And, and I just love the way that John reports on this encounter in Capernaum. Kind of the, the down-to-earth, sort of folksy way that he portrays the reality of it all. Because John says that when the crowds find Jesus, uh, they kind of do their best to sort of start small talk in Jesus, right? They're like, hey, Jesus, when did you get here? Isn't, isn't it a beautiful day today, Jesus? Don't you just love Capernaum in the morning? And by the way, have we ever told you how much we love that white robe with the light blue sash that you always wear? That just really looks good on you, Jesus. And then in verse 26, Jesus is like, okay, people, let's cut to the chase. I, I know why you're here. I know what's going on. You're here looking for me because I filled your bellies. I filled your stomachs. I spread out a meal for you of bread and fish. And you saw that sign and it opened up your mind. But let's be real, people. You're here because you're looking for more bread. Now, church, pay close attention because this is where the story transitions in a very important way. And you have to pay close attention because if you don't know Jesus well, and if you just kind of uh, assume that the caricature of him being just a generally a nice guy who gives you what you want, is true, then you probably would assume that what happens next is Jesus said, okay, you came here for bread. Let's see what I can do. All right, here's some more bread. Now, keep everybody happy. But see, friends, that's, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus isn't a walking bakery. Jesus is not a grocery store. He's not a magician. See, the people came after Jesus because Jesus had demonstrated a knack for producing barley loaves. And that was a highly useful thing for those people. If we just had someone who could provide bread for us, you know, out of thin air, that would be awesome. But Listen, church, Jesus is the embodiment of God himself and the fullness of God, the incarnate word made flesh, the Lord of the cosmos, will not simply be useful to you. Jesus is a lot of things, but he is not simply useful. See, you know, there's a lot of people out there that want to just make Jesus into something like that. You know, he's, Jesus is, is helpful as a spiritual Siri, you know, or Alexa. He's an answer man. Jesus is a bailout guy who you can pray to if you've forgotten to study for your exam. Jesus is the best way for you to win arguments with people. Jesus is useful. You know, my days go smoother when I tend to involve Jesus a little bit. But that is not Jesus' role. That's not the point of his coming to earth. Jesus refuses to simply be an intern in your life. Jesus is God among us, and God will not be reduced to usefulness. 
And the reason that's the case is because Jesus is the bread of life. What does he mean by that? Well, don't miss this. It's really important. By Jesus saying that he is the bread of life, Jesus is going to, in this story, draw a contrast. He's going to say, I am the bread of life, and therefore I am not your daily manna. Manna. What is manna again, church? Well, manna, according to the Old Testament books of Exodus and Numbers, was a sort of bread from above. And God provided this food to the people when they were wandering in the wilderness. And that manna was was helpful to them. It was sweet. It was delicious. But there was one significant problem with manna, and Jesus mentions it in this text. Manna didn't last. Manna was good for one day, two days at the most, when it had to be good for the Sabbath. But then it expired. It went sour. You know, I have to admit, church, I have a little thing about expiration dates. I'm one of those people at Fairway who always reaches to the back of the milk gallons you know, to find the one with the latest expiration. Anybody else willing to cop to that since you're in church? Okay, you can be honest. When you turn manna over and look at the bottom, the expiration date always says tomorrow. Manna fed you for today, but you were going to go hungry again tomorrow. And this is the common experience of life, both metaphorically and physically. We cycle through hungry, full, hungry, full, hungry, full. We all know that, right? We're going to be hungry, we're going to be full, we're going to be hungry. But actually, if you're like me, you, once in a while, <laughs> you have one of those meals where you're convinced the cycle has ended, right? You're so full that you think, that you're done eating for good. This always happens to me like when I go to the Brazilian steakhouse. Right? When they keep giving you meat over and over and over again until they tell you to stop. And you go there and you eat and you are so full that it hurts. And then you kind of waddle your way out of, of the restaurant and on your way to your car, you, you like grab your spouse and you take their face between your hands and you say... I want you to listen to me. Today is September 5. It's 7.08 p.m. And I want you to be a witness. I'll never eat food again. And it's a half hour after that. And we say this line. Have you used this line? Ice cream fills in the cracks. You guys say that line before? So you all want to hit up the DQ drive through I am in, right? Suddenly we're full and then we're hungry again. Jesus says no matter how much physical bread you get, it's going to be like manna and that it's going to last for a day and you'll be hungry again. And there's a lot of people who try to fill their hearts and satisfy their souls with spiritual manna, too. With short-term, get-me-through-the-day kind of therapy. I mean, what will get me through today? How about if I were to create an Instagram post or a Facebook post that would get 100 likes? That would make me feel really great about myself. At least until tomorrow. I mean, do I have something else I could post tomorrow? Or what about a, a vacation? I just need to get away and then I'll be fine. And the vacation's great, but before you know it, you're back at home with a huge credit card bill and a pile of laundry, and life pretty much goes on the way it did before. 
You know, every road trip ends with having to shop back out the sand and the Skittles because it comes to an end. How about a new toy? I mean, a new iPhone, a new girlfriend, a new major in school, and these things satisfy us for a day. But tomorrow, we're hungry again. I mean, in the story, this is even true of politics. The people wanted to make Jesus king. And and you're like, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, wasn't Jesus the true king of the Jews? Isn't this what we sing about all the time at Christmas? Born is the king of Israel? See, this, this ain't the right king. The people wanted a master of manna and not the true king. And Jesus knows we do not need manna. We need living bread. We need something that will sustain us tomorrow and the next day and into eternity. See, you think you want retweets and likes, but what you really need is love and affirmation. You think you want a vacation, but you really are longing for Sabbath and a break from having to perform for people. You think you want a new wardrobe, but really what you need is a deep cure for your self-image. You want toys and gadgets, not because they're so marvelous, but because your life is just restless right now. It just, you just, you don't ever feel at ease, and you think something like that will quiet your heart. You want a certain person elected because you feel disempowered and you need to know that someone powerful is on your side and agrees with you. You're going after the manna. You're going after the manna. You're gathering manna that spoils. And you need the bread of life. Such an important phrase especially that word life. You know, the New Testament church was written in Greek. And the Greek language actually has two words for life. One is bios, as in biology. And bios life is is the physiological state of being alive. Grass is bios. Bios is keeping the heart beating, keeping the lungs rising and falling. And God cares very much about bios life. He does. But that is not the word that Jesus uses in the Bible here. Jesus says that he is the bread of zoe life. Zoe is not the medical state of being alive, but the experience of truly living, of having joy, of having passion, of having contentment. It's not simply being alive, it is truly living. And Jesus says repeatedly, living forever. The old Methodist preacher Charles Allen told a heart-touching story from the end of World War II. As the war was drawing to a close, he says, the Allied armies gathered up many hungry orphans in Europe, and they were placed in camps where they were well-fed and well-cared for, but in spite of the excellent care they were given, the kids slept poorly, and they just seemed nervous and afraid. Well, finally, a psychologist came up with a solution. Each child was to be given a piece of bread to hold in his or her hand when they went to bed. And this bread was not to be eaten, but simply to be held. And when the children went to bed, knowing that there would be food for them tomorrow... Everything changed, and they slept soundly with miraculous results because they knew there was something beyond today. 
See, Jesus says you can eat manna for today and have bios for the moment. You can get the likes. You can buy a new car. You can go see Niagara Falls. But just like the people in the wilderness, Jesus says, you're going to die too. You will get sick. You will get cancer. You will perish in an accident. And what you truly need is not another loaf of barley. What you need is a kind of bread that will give you zoe life, eternal life that will continue and somehow unbelievably become even bigger and brighter and more beautiful when the bios life comes to an end. Church, why is it that God lets people get sick? Why is it that God lets people die? Why doesn't God stop these terrible things from happening? It's because more than bios life, God wants to give zoe life. A life that goes on for eternity. We come to this table this morning to participate in the eternal life-giving meal. Not so that Jesus can give us bread, but that he might become the bread that we really need. This bread is, is the physical sign of our spiritual hunger. And the loaf points us to the true bread. And church, that only works when we truly take Jesus in. And he says this. He says, you cannot be nourished by bread by thinking about bread. You cannot be filled by holding bread or reading about bread or doing a study on bread or even by smelling bread. You must take it in all the way. And to receive Jesus as the living bread, you need to open yourself completely to Jesus. No more poking around the edges. You've done your research. No more boiling Jesus down to just a means to a different end or a resource for your daily operations. You have to open yourself all the way to Jesus. And if you truly wish to be satisfied, you can come to him right now and have that Zoe life that goes on for eternity. Let's pray together as we approach the table. Lord, we thank you for revealing yourself as what we truly need, what fully satisfies. And now as we come to the table and as we hold and we touch and we taste your goodness, we are reminded that this hunger will return, but our spiritual craving was satisfied when we received the bread of life, Jesus Christ. So we pray in his name. Amen.